So happy new year, Paul. It's 2022. Here we are in a new year. Seems like nothing's changed. How have you been? Um, yeah, well, you just said nothing's changed. Uh, pandemic unchanged. Um, I still suck. That's unchanged. <laughs> um, yeah, I still get spam. Nothing's fixed. Nothing's improved. No jetpacks, no flying cars. I'm disappointed. I still get spam too, but I feel like it's getting, it's actually getting easier to discern between, especially phishing attacks are like, you remember when you used to get phishing attacks and they had like all the correct JPEGs and all the correct places and there was like, the links looked perfect and you really had to like examine the, the link and they like misspelled the, the website name or something. Like it used right, to be really sophisticated. Like, right, it would be like Banank instead of Bank, but other than that it was like an accurate copy. Yeah, and nowadays all the phishing attacks I'm seeing, at least, are these like really obvious, like no images and like weird formatting errors and like really strange, really strange phishing attacks. I, I don't know. Have you been experiencing that? Like strong, strong bad prank call levels of implausibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't see many. Uh, all of my email comes through Gmail, and it automatically, even for my non-Gmail addresses, like the stuff that goes to my domain, gets filtered by Google. So I never see any of that crap. So, yeah. To me, it's like phishing attacks sort of vanished a few years ago. Mm. But they're getting worse for you. Okay, in, like so you're like, you check your email and you get... Reg still get regular phishing attacks. Yeah, I occasionally I get them. I, they're not uh, they're not super frequent, but yeah, they're there are these phishing emails that I get, and and they're yeah, I I feel like what's going on is if they make them if they present the phishing email as too much like the the actual it like it, organizations emails, then they can be litigated. But if they're like really obviously not from the organization, then you can't like get them because it's obvious that they're not trying to pretend to be that organization. I don't know. I, I feel like there's some like legal pressure that's pushing them into this weird uncanny valley of phishing attack emails. How interesting. Yeah, like so they don't want to use your company logo or whatever. Yeah, because that would be an infringement on your intellectual property. But if like like misspell all of your company names and like don't have your website's name in there anywhere. And it's like, is it really a phishing attack or is it just like a prank? Like you said, like it feels kind of more like a prank email now. Right. It is funny. It seems to me um, the meta has shifted away from that sort of phishing attack. I, I see a lot of YouTube videos. Well, here's the thing on YouTube. I watched a couple of videos of people basically messing with scammers, right? somebody will get on the oh, phone yeah, with yeah. I watched a few of those too and like mess with their day and even counter hack their computers stuff like this and a lot of them is you know this is not everybody's everybody's picture of the cyber attacker is some dude some american dude in a hoodie in in a big city hacking your computer on his three screens you know on his big you know his his big jumbotron that he has in his his secret hacker lair in the basement sure is and, someone who's impossibly like both in a brazilian city with all those like identical high rises and like a rich american guy who's working for wall yeah. street and like a Chinese, like cyberpunk guy with his computer plugged into his temple somehow. Right. And it's often like, well, you can tell he's a bad guy because he hasn't shaved in like three and a half days. <laughs> right. He shaves regularly, but on like a bi-weekly basis. Right. So like the real thing, when you watch these hackers, you can see there's from a small handful of countries, pretty predictable. And it's not even, you know, it's not one guy in a basement. It's usually a bunch of guys in a common place and it's just their business. You know, they're not like, <laughs> this is just like what they do all day is they look for dumb people or senile people to exploit because, you know, for, you know, a few thousand American dollars is 
just low enough that like the FBI isn't going to go crazy and come after you, but it's high enough that it can really improve your standard of living in their country. Like it's small-ish by American standards and enormous by their standards. And that creates this yeah, incentive yeah. for them to just set up shop and make it a business. And a lot of times what they're doing isn't like really immoral. Like they're presenting something and they're like, hey, will you send us some money? And it's like, oh, sure, I'll send you some money. It's like, okay, well, there's nothing wrong, really. It's like it's like this weird kind of half busking, half scam kind of thing that they do. Right. Um, so maybe that's why phishing attacks are worse is because the highest quality hackers have moved on to this other area of I don't want to say more legitimate but more organized and probably more reliable like phishing is a shot in the dark and this newer system is more like telemarketing where I think they have numbers that they can project all right if we send this out we will get a thousand hits a thousand responses you know we send out 10 million emailed emails we'll get a thousand responses and we'll be able to take 20 of those and convert them into x amount of dollars and it just becomes a job of just sort of like ushering those people through their folly mm, yeah um and it's so i wonder if that's why phishing is so terrible because the best and the brightest of the hacking world have moved on to a more reliable gig well Phishing attacks might be getting worse, but there is some good news this year. The James oh? Webb Space Telescope is doing really phenomenally well. I, I said on my blog last year, that's all I want for Christmas is for the James Webb Space Telescope to have a good launch. And it yeah, had... It was flawless. It, flawless. The best possible launch. They were like, you know, oh, if this doesn't work, we'll have to burn a little extra fuel. And if this doesn't work, we'll have to burn a little extra fuel. So they were projecting, well, we hope that we'll get 10 years of usability out of it before it runs out of fuel. We, we want at least five. Anything less than five is failure. But our, our target is 10. And we got 20. Mm. We got everything. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> it was just everything went perfect. And I've been watching it. All of the um, all of the stages have, as far as we can tell, um, happened properly. The one about un unrolling the sun shield. I mean, I I'm a pri I've got primate hands that are pretty much really good at untangling complex manifolds like that. <laughs> and I know what a nightmare it is to like wrap a Christmas present and you've got a piece of thing that wants to fold over and a piece of tape that wants to stick to itself and static electricity and hope oh, these objects are sticking together and this one got caught on another one and you know even with your human brain at work dedicating all of your concentration complex folding jobs are a real challenge and this thing is gonna fly out into the darkness where you can't see anything and unfold itself using automated systems and motors and no intelligence whatsoever and has got to get it on the first try or everything's a failure and it did <laughs> yeah it's incredible it really is incredible how they how they put that thing together it's oh it's a marvel it really is so i am so happy i am just so happy i'm watching it uh, it's it's kind of funny they they have a real time like update of it where you can see its progress out towards the L2 Lagrange point. Is it Lagrange point or Lagrange? I said Lagrange for years, but I think it's Lagrange. I believe you're correct now and not ten years ago. Yeah, um, but it's really funny because they have two different timelines. One shows it in time. In terms of time, we're seventy five percent away there. In terms of distance, we're 90% of the way there. And it's kind of <laughs> weird when you think, and it's been doing this, like, oh, we barely started in terms of time, but look, holy cow, we're halfway there. It feels like, you know, right after the mission started, it feels like, oh, crap, you know, after a week and a half, we're going to be out there. But it's literally, we threw this thing up in the air, and, you know, you throw something straight up, and it goes slower and slower and slower, until finally it stops just for a second and begins falling back down right so mm. but what we've done i mean this is what 
rockets do is we've thrown it up in such a way that it will go slower and slower and slower, but not quite come back down. It will just stay up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's weird to think about, but it means that it the closer it is, the slower it's going towards the end. So we're going to be mm. like, so, you know, it's, all, it's almost there, but like you, pff, it's still a week to go, even though at the beginning of the journey, pff, that much distance, it, you know, covered that distance in two hours. So that's kind of funny to watch these two different timelines progress. I don't know. It makes me happy. It makes me happy to see that sort of the effect, picturing this, this sort of wily e. Coyote Acme rocket physics of something going up and going slower and slower and then hanging there for this implausibly long amount of time. No splash, Captain. It just, it makes me so happy. And, and the uh, L2 point is an unstable Lagrange point, right? So that's why they need fuel to kind of keep it on the tip of that needle. Right, as it were. right. Yeah, it's an unstable one. Like some of them are bowl shaped and once you stick it in there, it's, it's there forever. And then some of them are dome shaped in that, you know, it's, it's like spinning a top on top of, you know, you've got to keep nudging it to keep it at the top. Hmm. It's a shame that it's an unstable one or it could just stay out there for decades. Yeah. Well, it'll go somewhere after that, I'm sure. It, you know, go retire to, you know, maybe the L5 point or something. I don't know. Is there an L5? Yeah, yeah. L4 and 5 are the ones that are stable. They're the, the forward and backward 60 degree Lagrange points. Oh. Well, yeah, as we record this, it's lining all of its little mirrors up with each other. And it's so adorable and it makes me so happy. So, <laughs> yay, James Webb. <laughs> and each of those little mirrors is like the size of your house or whatever. Yeah, I, I guess once it gets out into space, you start thinking of it in astronomical terms, in which case this thing is a moat of dust floating in an infinite right. void. Right. But yeah, when it was on the ground, it's like, holy cow, this thing is honking big. <laughs> yeah. We're really going to launch this building into space? <laughs> this large piece of, of basic, you know, something the size of like... um earth moving equipment that you would see in a construction site. Picture something about that big and you're just going to chuck it out past the moon. But then once oh, it gets out yeah. there, it's like, pff, it's just barely, you can't even see it. It's not even a pixel. Hmm. Can earth on telescopes pick it up still? It seems like you must be able to. Uh, I read somewhere that, well, one of the problems with it is it's so friggin' dark. Mm. Like it's designed to not absorb a bunch of um, although, wouldn't it reflect? I guess if it's lined up in the right position, maybe the sun shield will bounce some sunlight back at us. But wait, wouldn't it always, wouldn't it always be in that position because that's what the L2 Lagrange point is? Does the moon ever get in the way of it? I know it's out beyond the moon, but does the moon's orbit get in the way of the L2 Lagrange point? I don't know. Uh, it'll intercept between, yeah, between the Earth and the and the L2 point. Occasionally, just like there's an eclipse every once in a while. I'll have coverage outages, I'm sure. Yeah, and somebody was like, why can't we, why didn't we put a GoPro on it to like, so we could watch it unfold and see this happen? Oh, yeah. Because that'd be so interesting. And they're like, it's pure darkness. I mean, that's the whole point of the <laughs> Utter blackness. Yeah. yeah, there's just, yeah. there's no way you would pick anything up. You could have the, the best camera in the world and you will not see anything any detail it is a you'd, perfect you'd have to have silhouette. a second other telescope watching that one <laughs> with a giant Christ. mirror you know to gather all the light and try to try to pick up the faint signs of the first telescope unfolding right because this thing is basically designed to be a perfect silhouette oh well wait weren't we supposed to be doing a show i we talked for too long about this i just wanted to say i'm happy what do you got for me paul well, I, I've been playing a video games. Uh, I played a bit of Bitburner uh, over the past three weeks now since we talked last. And um, it is a pretty fun idle game. Or what is it? A, um, RPG? Idle RPG? It's, you know, one of those um, unfolding games where you, you've got like a few mechanics and then you unlock more and more of them and it kind of expands. It's a, it's a good time. And it's free. Whoa, it, but I just loaded up the store page and it looks like... It's about writing code? Yeah, it's all in JavaScript. Ew! And they let this on the Steam store? <laughs> I 
It didn't even give me an age gate when I tried to click on it. Gross. I know. I it's I, it's really terrible I what kid. they're doing to minors these days. I know. I kid, I kid, because, like, the I follow programmer humor on Reddit, and, of course, everybody looks down on everybody else's language. I mean, I'm really not a mm -hmm. fan of JavaScript, but it absolutely has its place. It it is not, it is not a garbage language. <laughs> it is not a it is not a stupid language that has no reason to exist. It absolutely has a valid niche, um, and there is a very good reason it exists. But um, you know, it's it's not what I use. It's not useful to the stuff I work on. So, ooh, that's a dumb language. <gasps> It's not a serious so language. Well, it is a game, you know. It's like a game language. It's kind of a toy, really. Right. Well, and that's that's valid. You don't want everything to be, you know, assembler or C. You know, there's right. there's there's room for this whole spectrum of stuff. So there's a like um, a subset of JavaScript that you can write these little scripts in inside the game, but the game itself runs on JavaScript, and then you can also write JavaScript in the game to execute in the game, but also you can like later, you know, spoilers for Bitburner, you can unlock things that allow you to modify the game code itself. So that's that's a whole trip. Um, here's something. Since we're talking about this, um, there was a game I saw it on Steam. I read it and I was like, "Oh, that's so interesting." And then I clicked away from it without putting it on my wish list, and now I can't remember what it was called or where I saw it. But it was. Not only are you designing your own computer, but you're designing your own, like, chips with your own commands. Like, you're sort of designing your own CPU. Hmm. And, uh, like and... Like a hardware engineering kind of thing. Right. That's what the description made it sound like. And I was like, oh, how interesting. That would be a, a different, interesting way to look at Assembler is, oh, here's why Assembler has to be the way it is. Because... This is how you build a chip. I, you know, that seemed like an interesting way to look at the look at the thing. And I really wanted to play it or check it out. And this was before Christmas. And I put it on, uh, or I didn't put it on my list. And now I don't know what it was called or where I saw it. And it's not in my history and just pff, gone. But I'll bet somebody out there knows what it was called. And they can help me. But so BitBurner is fun? Uh, yeah, I had a fun time with it. I... So I, I, I started playing it and it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you start your thing and you can like hack some computers and then you write some code to hack some computers and then you've like hacked a bunch of computers and they're they're sitting there generating money for you and then you're like, okay, well now I gotta wait for like an hour for them to generate enough money for me to buy the next thing, to do the next thing, to unlock the thing, to do, you know, how those games go. And uh, so I was sitting there for right. a little bit and then I was like, I'm just gonna change my system clock to be an hour from now. Right. And and it says in the game that there's like, oh, offline time, right? So if they like, close the game and then you open it later and it's like, oh, you know, it does stuff offline. So I like close the game down, set my system clock forward to tomorrow or whatever, and then open it up again. And it's like, oh, yeah, cool. You know, you did your thing and, you know, now you've got a bunch of money or whatever. And it's like, all right, cool. And then I'm like, well, why, why should I not do it more than a day? What Can I do it a year? Can I do it right. a hundred years? It seems like the more convenient way to do it would be to roll your clock back to like the 80s, start the game up, and then update your clock to modern day. Um, so that way you yeah, don't yeah. keep well, I, rolling your clock forward. I did run into a problem where I'm I'm here and my computer thinks it's like 2320 or whatever it is. And uh, then I'm like, oh, I'm going to go on the wiki and like see, you know what this, you know, it's some API call or whatever. And so I go on the wiki and, and Google's like, hey, better be careful. This site's security certificate is like super expired. <laughs> they might be trying to pull something funny on you. And my Gmail doesn't work because it's like, hey, there's, there's something weird going on. Gmail servers are like totally not updating their security protocols. Oh, that's funny. So Google's watching out for you. It's, you're making sure you're safe. Well, I'm and glad then, there's someone we can trust. Thanks, Google. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Google. And then I was playing the game, and I'm like, oh, I'll just roll my thing back, right, to modern day so that I can, you know, use the w the wiki or whatever. And so I roll it back, and then Steam's like, hey, you've been playing this game for negative 3,476 hours. Like, do you, have, do you want to post a review? <laughs> oh, weird. 
Yeah. Yeah, it did eventually fix itself, but for a while there it was it was like negative some millions of hours gameplay on the, you know, on the Steam storefront thing. It's pretty it's pretty crazy. Aren't we coming up on like 2030 something? We're coming up on the limit of the the traditional Linux timestamp that begins at January 1st, 1970. I believe that that hits its ceiling at you know on a either 32 or 64 you know number of seconds elapsed since January 1st mm, 19, right 1970 right. um that partic which is the most common clock I interacted with in all my years of programming that was like what all other timestamps were derived from like you can convert everything mm. into other formats but you always the the sort of default is to store it in number of seconds. And I believe yeah, that ground in, truth in, timestamp. Yeah, and I believe that is going to blow up. Like this is back when Y2K turned out to fizzle out and didn't end the world. I remember a lot of people saying, "Okay, that wasn't bad, but just wait until 2030. That's when it's going to get really nuts because that's when it will really break the timestamps that we're using now." Mm, yeah, it's not um, just a, a conventional representation. It's an actual numeric limit on the, the integer size that they've been using for a while. Although maybe it got fixed when we moved from 32 to 64 bit computing. I don't know. Um, somebody mm. who knows more about that thing can probably enlighten me in the comments. Anyway, BitBurner looks amusing. I love one of these screenshots shows a map of the world done in ASCII art. I don't know, stuff like that just makes me super happy. It reminds me of the games I used to see, you know, as a teenager. When mm. there was no graphics, yeah, it, all there the, was only All the ASCII. stuff is ASCII. It's all, yeah, it's all ASCII art. It's it's pretty fun. Yeah. I've, uh, I've since, since then, like, you know, modifying my clock, I had just cracked open the game source file because it's all just in JavaScript, you know, plain text. And uh, modified it so that I basically I basically won the game. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fun time until you get to the point where you're fed up and you just want to break the game forever. It is kind of funny. I see it has a code editor that has context highlighting and everything. And that's sort of, you know, it, in the world where we were using ASCII art and we didn't have graphics, we did not have tools like this. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is like, this is like using a computer to work on your horse-drawn buggy, you know, it's like... Yeah, and you open up Blender and you got the 3D model of the horse-drawn buggy and you're like, oh, where should I put right. the, the stirrups? Right, exactly. It's like this weird mishmash of different eras. But it, it's fine. It's fine. It's charming. That's great. What do you say we do some mailbags? Yes, let's. Dear Diecast, what are your thoughts on watching no commentary play... Hang on. I... I I have this on my secondary monitor and it's too far away from my old eyes. Let me put it in front of me. There we go. Dear Diecast, what are your thoughts on watching no commentary playthroughs of a video game to get its story, whether the watcher has played the game entirely, partially, or not at all? All the best and Happy New Year, Andrew. Um, do you have any thoughts on this, Paul? I do, but I'm curious what yours are. Yeah, I, I like watching playthroughs of games. Usually I watch them with commentary just because it's interesting to hear what the person playing the game thinks of it. Um, but if you don't want to know what the person playing the game thinks of it, then sure. I mean, that, that's kind of the, that's kind of the ideal in my mind of a story game is like, there should be a mode where you can just like dispense with the gameplay if you don't want to engage with it and just engage with the story. And that's basically what a, a no commentary playthrough is. Yeah. I usually prefer to, I only do that for something if I'm curious what's in the game, but I don't enjoy the gameplay. Um, mm -hmm. And that's pretty rare. And the, the really the only game that I'd really, really felt that way about was Dark Souls. You know, it's like, oh, I, I kind of want to see more of Dark Souls, but I don't want to have to, like, spend all this time mastering <laughs> Dark Souls enough to get to that point in the game to see this other stuff. <laughs> right, right. Actually play Dark Souls. Right. But there's not... But watching a no commentary run is, you know, four hours of fighting skeletons and then like, you know, four, 15 seconds of dialogue. Um, it's pretty sparse. And really, you, you kind of need commentary to really get a feel for what the person's going through. Hmm. Um, like, 
no commentary run of Dark Souls unless it's like some godlike speed run it would be kind of boring. Yeah, and so even I then, don't do it the speed run narrated by the speedrunner is is where it's at. Yeah. Yeah, the, oh, here I'm going to manipulate the skeleton, then he's going to swing at me here, and I, this would normally cause me to fall to my death, but because I'm sliding down this piece of rock, it'll negate the fall damage and allow me to land on this thing and kill it with one hit, and this is where you pick up this super sword. Now, I'm not actually going to use it in combat, but by having this sword in my inventory, it causes this other thing to appear, <laughs> which will cause a boss, to, and you're like, and meanwhile, he's like, you know, by the time he finishes his sentence, he's at the closing credits, and you're like, what just happened? <laughs> right. It took me longer right. than that to beat the first boss. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, I guess the answer, Andrew, is uh, you're dumb. <laughs> yeah, so I prefer... I, I don't usually watch people play, um, but if I do, I definitely want commentary. So, I don't know what no commentary runs are for. I, I understand that. I mean, they, they have no purpose to me. Shall I take the next one? Yeah, go for it. Dear Die Castles, When looking back on the history of this site, one could make the argument that the most prominent content is the analysis of plots, with a strong focus on identifying and questioning the existence of plot holes. What plot holes do you find to be the most annoying? Those which are easily avoidable? those which are most obvious, or those which are less noticeable but risk the complete breakage of immersion in the story once discovered, the kind that once seen can never be unseen. Regards, Zedekai. Thank you, Zedekai. That is a, that's a good question. So what do you think on plot holes? Do you, you don't play story games that much, though. Yeah, I, I usually uh, tend to watch the Let's Plays of them, but uh, if I am playing <laughs> a game that's got story, or, you know, I'm reading a book or something like that, um, the plot holes that annoy me the most are actually the world building mechanical holes where like the the author presents the world in a certain way and then later goes back on that presentation or um, fails to d distinguish between the real world and the fantasy world in some way and then just assumes that everyone knows about this divergence uh, things like that where it's like the the world itself is broken in some way that can't be reconciled no matter what the characters are doing for me, I, I kind of cringe when I realize I'm known as the plot hole auditor guy because I don't like being in that role. Like, I don't think the most important thing about making a good story is making sure you don't have any plot holes. Like, it's much more important to get the emotional beats right. Get a character, help us understand what they want, get us to care about them, cre make them real. Um, that's the really critical stuff. Although, and we don't normally start to care about plot holes until the writer accomplishes that first thing. Like, there are lots of stories that are, you know, you an U-Bowl movie, like, is riddled with plot holes <laughs> that nobody cares about because right. nobody cares about the movie itself because it's just a bunch of stupid noise. Um, there's probably tons of plot holes in Rage, Rage 2. But it was mm. like, it was so hard to care about that world, and it was just so, sort of, everything was sort of arbitrary. It was like, here, you're the protagonist, so the, and here is your village, therefore you care about them. And no effort to actually establish characters or relationships or personal goals or stakes. And so worrying about, hey, you keep changing the rule. I mean, there were problems like that in there, but they were not the biggest problem. But when I do care about plot holes, it usually I am most ir ir irritated with ones that seem like sloppy work. Just seem like you weren't even trying. This is easy to fix with one line of dialogue and, you know, covers a multitude of sins. You didn't even think that my immersion was something you needed to maintain. There was just something you needed to have happened. So you, like pinned my character down in a cutscene, took away all their powers, ignored the, how they, you know, their personal goals, and had them do nothing while the events of this cutscene unfolded. And that, that really... Right, or, or inexplicably way. collaborated with their downfall in some stupid way. Right, right. So basically, you're saying that you don't even care if the world doesn't make any sense as long as the characters are engaging enough. But if they start to become engaging and then they trip somewhere, then it's like, okay, well, 
everything kind of gets cast in this harsh light where it's like, okay, well, why did that happen? Right. And, and what's that doing here? And who are you? Right. And, uh, well, I suppose the other thing, you can get me to care about the character or you can get me to care about the gameplay. That's the other thing. Oh, I, I'm just having a good time playing the game. But then you keep negating. Every cutscene is just a setback. I accomplished... This is um the... the Fable uh, school? Fable. Uh, Capcom does this with their Resident Evil games. Is I accomplished something in gameplay. Then there's a cutscene that negates my accomplishments. Puts me in a new predicament. And then dumps me back into gameplay. So cutscenes are only ever setbacks, and I have to be hyper competent at all time to survive. But then, when when things are handed off to my character for a cutscene, they're just this horrible griefing dunce that ruins my life and undoes all my work. That's pretty <laughs> bad too. Even if I don't right. care about the characters, I find that particularly offensive. That's really odious. I really hate that. It's like if you were playing an RPG and you had one of those really malevolent DMs and then they get to take half of your turns and you're just like, why, yes. why am I doing this to myself? Right. Okay, well, I'm going to take the, I'm going to take this turn and uh, I'm going to throw your sword off this cliff, um, you know, eat these small <laughs> right. rations and pee my pants. <laughs> okay, your turn. <laughs> and it's like... <laughs> <laughs> well, oh no, and then, like, and then he gets the turn of all the monsters and the foes in the game, right? And they do all this confident stuff, and then it's your turn again. Right, right, and you know, oh, it's my turn, and I've got, I've pissed my pants, I'm sick from spoiled food, and I'm weaponless. And it's like, I don't even care anymore, this isn't my <laughs> character. This is your punching bag. You want me to keep animating your punching bag so you can continue punching them. Right. Right, it's the sandcastle thing, right? You know, keep building a sandcastle. Yeah. I want to knock it down again. Right, it's the it's the writer. That's that's the mo thing that pisses me off the most is when the writer is gratifying themselves instead of entertaining the audience. There, that's the answer. That's my final answer, is when the writer entertains themselves instead of the audience. That's what really, really pisses me off. And sometimes that's plot holes, and sometimes that's just just whatever. Yeah, yeah, working through their own personal issues in the form of a game. It's like, no, don't, don't do that. All right. Okay, next up. Dear DieCast, I hope you're doing well. As I was watching a stealth section in the latest stream of Batman Arkham Origins with Chris and Seamus, I realized how integral vents are to a lot of action franchises. From the vents of Nakatomi Plaza and Die Hard, through the numerous vents found in Half-Life, all the way to the vents Batman crawls through while sneaking, sneakily downing mooks. Indeed, the moment I see a vent in real life, the first thing I think about is how I can pry it open and sneak undetected through the whole building. All that being said, though, I really want to ask Paul's opinion as an engineer who's actually worked in HVAC. How realistic are the vents we see in video games and action movies? What do you think of the ones in Batman games? Are vents really the Achilles heel of every single security system in the world? as they seem to be portrayed in media. Keep being awesome, Lino. That's a fun question. That is a fun question. I uh, I had the pleasure of working with my best friend as my boss in HVAC, and we're both nerds. And so we did discuss this at length of like, how big would a vent have to be for someone to call through it? And like, would you actually be able to call through without the supports falling out of the ceiling? <laughs> right. You know, stuff like that. Every, every vent that I've seen in real life, you know, you go to some boiler room or a basement in a, in a building somewhere and you see it's really thin aluminum like if you put a person in there it seems like it would just immediately crumble like crawling around inside <laughs> a soda can it would just like immediately right. tear tear to shreds that's what my now i could be wrong um but that's what it in my intuition tells me what happened to these materials but i don't know how does it work when you get on the really big industrial scale yeah well and so there's there are ducts that are made that you could walk around inside so there's so i, I guess to approach this from like one end to the other uh the the vents that you see in the ceiling you know in like a drop ceiling office or something like that they're like you know the two foot by two foot square vents those are usually only about 100 cfm and so they're the ducts that go into those are about eight inches in diameter. So unless you're very strange, you're not going to be calling around in those. 
Okay. And uh, and if you did, right, of course, they would just like fall out of the ceiling because they're not very big and so the supports aren't very strong. Um, in general, people don't like to waste money designing vents that are just like super huge for no reason. So the vents in video games are usually maybe like two feet, maybe three feet square. And those are like yeah. minimum 10,000 CFM. And so it's like, that would be a whole building, right? A whole building vent or something like that would be like the the, mm -hmm. the big return vent that's coming in. And so that's not going to be throughout the whole building. That's just going to be right at the big air conditioner. That's like the that's like the highway of the vents, and then it would break off into smaller vents before it got to a room. That's the right, artery. Right, exactly. Yeah. So like convention centers, yeah, you might have some vents that you could walk around inside in a convention center. Or um, if you had like a really gargantuan data center or something like that that has a lot of cooling capacity so that you can keep all the the servers cool yeah you could have some vents that are that big so like there are some vents that are that size most of the games portrayed you're walking around like offices or like storage areas storage areas don't need very much ventilation that even you know even aside from the heating and cooling you do have to ventilate a little bit so that the air stays fresh but um it's not a lot and and a lot of times what you're crawling through isn't like a supplier return vent because those would go straight back to the central unit there are transfer ducts that are transferring from one area to another area which do happen occasionally um but they're not very common because they don't actually do anything they're just transferring air through a space so they're usually like in storage rooms or something like that and again they don't have to be very much they, they can be really small you know like maybe one foot by six inches or something so there's like tiny little ducts in the walls um so like yeah, in general, they aren't very realistic. And then even if the vents were required to be that big and you had transfer vents between rooms and things for some reason, because that's the other weird thing is like you have this transfer duct, but it goes like way over the room to the other side. So you can sneak behind the guards when really they just punch right. it through the wall. Like it's not going to be this big, long, elaborate thing for no reason. Right. They want it to be as short as possible and they don't want it to take up a bunch of the building's footprint. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. That and, space and is precious. Right. That's the one that gets me is when you get one of those vents that only connects two rooms. And I'm like, oh, so so this office only gets its fresh air through the bathroom, <laughs> through the restrooms. <laughs> All air in this room has to first pass through the through the men's toilet before it comes into the office. <laughs> yeah, you get that, fired for that, that kind of thing in HVAC. You don't last right. long if you do that too often. Now, maybe in, in Gotham City, you know, everyone's corrupt and they're all, like, oversizing all the ducts by an order of magnitude for no reason. And you could justify it. But even if the ducts were that big, they would be super, super loud. It would be like crawling around inside yeah. of a drum, you know, like a big old bass drum or whatever. It's just like, boom, 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 echoing everywhere. And because they're enclosed hard surfaces, the sound travels tremendously well through ducts. Uh, that's one of the problems that you run into in HVAC for doing like uh, sound rooms or recording studios. You have to have tons and tons of baffles and, and insulation and padding all inside the ducts so that the sounds from the outside or from the air conditioner don't get into or out of the space. Um, otherwise, the ducts will just carry the sounds really well. And, and transfer ducts too, if you want to like have an office that has a transfer duct for return or something, uh, you'll be able to hear the conversations inside the office just through that transfer duct really easily. So you have to put baffling in and it gets complicated. Um, which brings me to another thing, like even if the sound wasn't a problem, almost all ducts have features inside them that would make them very difficult to traverse. So you've got baffles for sound dampening, you've got fans, of course, and they're not like those giant fans that are moving super slow because while those would be very quiet, they waste a huge amount of space and they're big and heavy and they're expensive. And so people put like the smallest, loudest fan that they can into the ducts and which means that you're never going to crawl through them so uh right. yeah all that put together like ducts are not a good way to get around in a building unless uh you've got really really oversized ducts and you don't mind being heard um one of my favorite in fact my favorite mythbusters moment is when they played around with this and they were trying to crawl through ducts and it was so loud and adam was on one side when somebody was trying to just crawl through the not trying to do anything amazing just trying to move through the ducks and he was like thor the god of thunder is in our ventilation system 
because <laughs> it was so loud. The idea that you would sneak, even if you were moving very quietly, even if you're just inching along, that's sort of being magnified by these long metal tubes so that every little sniff and breath is just going to be so loud to the people on the far end where you're going that by the time you get there, there's going to be a circle of guards gathered around the vent you're coming out of going, what is that sound? That is really noticeable. Right. Someone needs to call the technician, take that, get that looked at intensively and scrutinized. One thing I did, one thing that's captivated me about the world of like building infrastructure. When I was in high school, I had a um, class for photography. Like, this is old school. You go out with a single red lens reflex camera, take pictures, take them back, and develop them in the school's dark room. It was oh, the wow. coolest class ever. I mean, it was only black and white. We didn't do color stuff. But for whatever reason, and there was a really cool, like there was a three, you, you had to make it so that somebody couldn't just open the door to the dark room and ruin everybody's pictures, right? Mm -hmm. So what they had was a cylindrical chamber between the, there were, there's the main classroom and then two dark rooms. I forget what we had two dark rooms, maybe just, you know, for different groups of students. But anyway, so you would get into this, it's like a, a bank, like the rotating doors in a bank. You would get into mm, this yeah. and turn it. And then that would give you access to one of the other rooms so that you could enter without bring in any outside light for right. whatever reason and i can't remember why i had to crawl up into the drop ceiling of this one of these dark rooms i <laughs> wish i could remember what on earth was the occasion what did i what i have to assume i was not a troublemaker so i have to assume that i was not doing this sneaking into the ceiling for no reason and i can't remember the particulars of this why did we need someone i can i can believe that they would pick me i was i was tall and lanky if you're gonna send somebody up into the ceiling for some reason maybe to retrieve an item that got up there somehow i would be probably one of your first picks in the room very light but I remember mm. I had to go up into the drop ceiling and I'd never seen above a drop ceiling. And I always pictured a drop ceiling was like three inches high. You know, it's just like tiny little gap. But this drop ceiling was, um, was that magical vent space, right? It was that three feet yeah. high so that a human being can exist. And I could stand on top of the wall between the rooms. Oh, so it wasn't could, a full height wall. Right. Now, this was within the classroom. This was the dark rooms, the wall separating the dark room from the classroom and the dark rooms from each other. You could stand on that and it sort of exist up in this magical place up above the classroom. And I definitely poked around in there more than I needed to once I got up there. I was like looking for any excuse to extend my stay as much as possible. Because it was just this, like, so much more vast and open than I dreamed it could have been. And to this day, every time I see a big drop ceiling, I'm always like, I wonder what it's like. up. Mm, yeah. I wonder, can you get up there and move around? And, like, it felt like if, if I got up there, I could have moved around the school. Um, no, the problem is you can't walk on a drop ceiling. It will collapse. It will not hold your human height. Um, <laughs> you, you will fall. But there were in this building, there were large metal beams, and you could get on top of one. Like, if you go into, like, a Target or a Walmart and just look up at the ceiling, you'll often see these big, long girders crossing the length of the building. In mm. this classroom, that was above the drop ceiling. So you could get on top of that and scooch, a cr scooch along. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get on that, scooch along, and see if you could get into other classroom areas. And I could not find that out. <laughs> oh, fun. That was a long digression. I am sorry for taking us on that long journey. Are we out of time now? We got time for some more? We Let's do one more. Okay. 
Dear Diecast, how do you feel about respecking the process where RPGs let you allocate all your ability points slash perk choices slash whatever else? It seems like all the points on the spectrum of respec availability have drawbacks. Respec such a liberal, you lose the satisfaction of making long-term decisions. Too conservative, if your build ends up being unfixably suboptimal. So where do you prefer things to fall? 93. Thank you, 93, as always. So for me, respects are an interesting thing. They, to me, they feel like a safety mechanism on the part of the designer. Hmm. Let's say, let's say we've got some sort of game that um, offers a really wide variety of skills, and it's not just do you want to do pistol or shotgun, or do you want to do melee or you know, but like combat, non-combat, dialogue, traversal. You can get. Because it's like, well, what if somebody put all their points into traversal, traversal, and nothing into combat? What happens when you get to the end of the game, when it's when it's mook o'clock and you've got to fight ten billion guys? What if a player has invested all in speechcraft and and duct crawling, and it's <laughs> like, and we don't want them to be able to to bluff their way and crawl through ducks to beat the game they you actually have to fight dr evil at the end what do we do so it's a safe to me it seems like a safety mechanism what if the player makes a build that can't beat the game having a respect will save you from the worst failure mode which is the player being unable to complete the game and needing to start over if they want to beat it mm. it makes it makes all decisions less interesting, but in return, it makes it so that you don't have the worst failure, worst possible failure case. It saves you from that. Although it does present some odd problems with the narrative, like as seen from a bird's eye view, where right. you've got this guy who's like, you know, this brawler, scarred face guy who's like real tough. And then, like, he goes in the bathroom one day and comes out a, an eloquent Shakespearean actor, and you're like, well, that's a little weird. And and now he's, like, you know, doing all these bluff checks and, like, you know, impressing the ladies. And it's like, okay, that's... I mean, I could believe either one of those, but both of them in the same story it seems a little unbelievable somehow. Right. And so to to get... To fix that, to sometimes make... Sometimes make respec cost something, like so that you can't do it more than once or maybe you have to grind for a bit if you want to respec or just you know this is you have to work for it to make sure that you can't trivially switch between the best possible combat build and the best possible non-combat build on a per encounter basis yeah yeah i feel like the ideal uh solution to this quandary is to just have the game keep track of whatever the highest skill check you needed to pass was in whatever build you were using, you know, in your playthrough, and then you can't respec out of that at any point, right? So if you had like a really good swim check and you swam across the river or whatever, and then later you want to get those points back, it's like, well, you use that to swim across the river, and you know, we keep track, and like this is this is where you'd have to go back to, you know, and so you can like reload the game back to that point and then respec and find some other way to solve that problem. But otherwise, like, you know, this is what you did and these were what your skills are, you know, that were required to do those things. But then if you, you know, expect into swimming and you end up never swimming at all, it's like, oh, yeah, fine. Just like, spec out of that. It turns out you weren't good at swimming because you didn't really need to be. <laughs> I mean, Deus Ex had that exact problem. You could spend tons of points on swimming. And I think there was one point in the game where you actually needed to swim and it was not that far. Right. And so if you, like, decided to do... And the first level took place on an island, so you're, like, thinking, oh, boy, this game, look at all this water. Swimming's going to be a big deal, and then you put everything into swimming, and it's, like, waiting for the water to show. There actually is a lot of water in the game, but you don't need to go through any of it. And I never found mm -hmm. that. It wasn't like, oh, wow, going through this water let me skip a ton of stuff. And you don't want to, and the other thing in Deus Ex, you don't want to skip a ton of stuff. Like, that's content. Ah, uh, yeah. I don't want to skip 10 rooms. That's 10 rooms of loot. <laughs> you swim through the canal and you just find all these shotguns lying on the bottom. Like, oh, cool. <laughs> right. Oh, the money, shotguns, tools. Lambs just sitting there on the steps. Right. So I don't know. I guess, to me, respects are kind of a an insurance policy for the developer to make sure that nobody gets stuck 
even though they're weird, immersion-breaking, and not great. They're sort of there to save the player from the worst-case scenario. Um, mm. You know you know what? I want to do one last mailbag question here. Um, I'm not even going to read the whole question. Just the thrust is, am I going to do an audiobook of Mass Effect, my Mass Effect book? Uh, no. No, that is just too long. I love the idea of having an audiobook of one of my books. Like, if I was going to do an audiobook of any of my books, I'd do it for the other kind of life. But mm. it is super time consuming to do. You know, in the time it would take me to do, like, the other kind of life, in the time it would take me to make an audiobook version of that, I could make, you know, several videos that would be watched by thousands, tens of thousands. Or I can make this audiobook that will be listened to by maybe a few dozen. It's just never worth it. Um, and that's even more true for Mass Effect. Mass Effect, yeah, it just wouldn't work out. And I've, and I'm so sick of the project anyway. So I'm sorry, I will not do. <laughs> On the other hand, um, anybody else is welcome. You know, if you just want to read the friggin' thing and put it on YouTube, go for it. I'm not going to, <laughs> I'm not going to complain. Please, by all means, that'd be lovely. You get together with some people and, you know, split up chapter by chapter and do it if you want to do it that way. But, um, yeah, I'm not going to do it. It's just too much. It's too much work and it would not, it would take me away from doing work that would reach more people. Hmm. I, I do wish that I had more time to do audiobook recordings because they are fun and it's neat to, to be able to yeah. listen to, to a work instead of read it. But, um, yeah, they are very time consuming. All right. Thanks so much to everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at seamusyoung.com. Um, do we have any other announcements for the new year? Actually, I do have some other announcements, mm. but I will save them for later in this week. Um, yeah. So that's it. Thank you, for everyone, for listening. And um, say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. Until next time.